My name is Anna Wiegenmark and I'm a Secretary General for Föreningen Ordfront uh, and the Human Rights Lawyer. Um, and by my side is Stephen Watts, staff, staff attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union in the United States. Um, and what we're going to talk, to, to talk about today is the CIA torture against so-called terrorist suspects and the work that the ACLU has done for 15 years or so now um, to get some of them justice in courts. Um, so Stephen is one of the attorneys who has been taking, trying to get some justice for the torture survivors um, and try to, to bring, sue a number of first the government officials, the CIA uh, or the director and, and even um, uh, air flights, air, air companies in order to get, some, to get uh, one day in court for the torture victims. And he will tell us about the whole process and the work they have done in particular from the point of view of the survivors and what it takes to go through all these procedures and perhaps not even getting a, a day in court. This year finally three of his clients did make it to court and he will tell us a little bit about all of the um, ordeals that had got to go through in order to actually get a, um, a court hearing and what happened afterwards. So I'm very pleased to welcome Stephen, uh, whom I actually have met before <laughs> some 15 years ago when we were working on the same case, um, a similar case, uh, to Sweden and give him a big hand. So thanks Anna for the introduction and again thanks to Orkron for the kind invitation and for everyone for um, hanging around this Saturday afternoon to uh, hear what I have to say about uh, accountability for US torture in uh, US courts. Um, but before I begin, or maybe I should give you a bit of background on myself, Anna's given you um, a short summary of, of, of my work, but for the past 15 years or so I have been involved in work on behalf of men detained at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, um, arbitrary detention. And from about 2002 onwards, I started work on behalf of men who had been tortured and cruelly treated by the United States. Um, so I've had a 15 year history of involvement in uh, US policies and practices of torture, forced disappearance, and arbitrary detention. Um, so I feel in a position to talk about accountability and the measures that have been taken um, since I began my work in the United States to try and get some accountability, some measure of redress for many of the victims and survivors of these policies and practices. Um, but what I'd like to do, because it was so long ago, is to start with um, an overview of uh, United States involvement in torture practices. And when I was putting my remarks together for this um, uh, presentation today, I thought about no better place to start than the very first newspaper report that I read, a comprehensive newspaper report that I read on US torture practices in the post 9 11 era. And there was a piece by Dana Priest and Barton Gellman, two very prominent Washington Post reporters. And you'll see the date of it. It was tucked away um, the day after Christmas on 2002 on the front page of the Washington <coughs> Post. Uh, and the title of this speaks volumes. U US decries abuse but defends interrogations. Stress and duress tactics used on terrorism suspects Hold in secret, held in secret overseas prisons. Um, and there's a number of takeaways that you can take from this article, and I would recommend uh, you to read, read the entire article. Um, but what those takeaways um, are, in essence, were that in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks against the United States, um, the CIA, CIA and other government agencies embarked on a program um, of capturing terrorists, who they suspected of involvement uh, in, uh, in terrorism, and principally members of the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. Um, and uh, the then Taliban government in power in Afghanistan, um, and not only capturing them, and rendering them to either secret uh, CIA-run prisons overseas, 
or to the hands of foreign governments where the practice of torture um, was routine. Um, so what US officials were doing, in other words, then, were resorting to the use of torture as an interrogation tool, as a way of getting information, or they were turning a blind eye to other governments' use of torture, both in violation of uh, binding uh, international commitments that the United States have given, in particular in the Convention Against Torture, and US domestic laws themselves. Um, and in this article, you'll see a quote from um, then head of the Counterterrorism Center, um, a man by the name of Kofor Black. And what he said that what he said that in the aftermath of the 9/11 attacks, the gloves came off. And what he was saying, in other words, was that the United States is going to abandon the rule of law, including the prohibition against torture, in order to track down detain and interrogated persons who it suspected were involved in terrorism. And I stress the point, suspected. There was no charges, um, they were suspects only. And the CIA invented its criteria about who could be picked up and who could be detained and who could be interrogated. No, no court was involved. This was, this, these were executive decisions. Um, over the years, um, of many of the key facts um, in this Washington Post article and in others, uh, journalists did an incredible job at this time of peeling the layers of secrecy back of a program that the CIA and other agencies of government at the time tried to shroud in secrecy. They peeled them back. Um, and these newspaper reports were not only um, confirmed uh, by other journalists, they were actually confirmed by um, numerous reports of, from men who had been detained by the CIA and subsequently released, um, or men who were detained, being detained at Guantanamo and are still there, or men who had been released um, from the custody of foreign governments. They all had similar stories to speak of unspeakable um, torture and cruel treatment in custody while they were being interrogated. Um, and what, what, what these reports amount to was the United States' involvement in egregious violations of human rights, the prohibition of arbitrary detention, the prohibition of forced disappearance, the prohibition of torture and cruel treatment. And at the time, many of those crimes constituted war crimes. Um, but today what I'd like to do is focus on um, uh, the work of US lawyers uh, in the accountability push. Uh, and in particular, one, one of these cases. Um, and this is one case of a number. Um, yesterday I talked about the other, uh, what I call unsuccessful, successful cases. But I'd like today to focus on the one successful case uh, in 15 years of seeking accountability in US courts for victims and survivors. Um, and those cases were brought, all brought against um, the architects um, of, of, the, of the program and others, including uh, US corporations that were involved in supporting the program, including um, logistical support to the aircraft that the US used to ferry um, detainees from point A to point B, point B being um, the end point being important, um, that program of extraordinary rendition. Um, but even though we lost all of those cases, all but the one, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about shortly, um, they all helped shine a spotlight uh, on US torture, further exposing it and pressurizing US policymakers to rein it in. Um, and ultimately to change US policies um, on United States use of secret prisons and torture and cruel treatment. Um, and it's telling that within three days of Obama taking office, um, he passed executive orders. Um, they weren't the law of the United States, but they were executive orders, um, which 
uh, prohibited the use of secret um, CIA um, prisons, um, and it also reaffirmed the absolute prohibition of torture and cruel treatment by all agencies of government or, uh, and the CIA, CIA in particular. So it took the CIA out of the detention and interrogation business uh, completely. And that was in large part due to the uh, work of journalists, but also those cases that lost in US courts by exposing the program for what it is and putting a human face on the suffering that um, these violations of international law um, caused uh, many, many men. Um, the losing cases to also help lay the foundations for future legal redress um, for some torture survivors, including two men, um, Suleiman Abdallah, uh, Mohammed Ben Soud, and the family of a third killed in CIA custody, uh, Gul Rahman. And that case um, is Saleem versus Mitchell. Um, so what was key about Saleem versus Mitchell uh, prevailing in US courts um, and its ultimate success, I believe, in, la in large part, um, was the release of an executive summary um, of a report authored by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence um, on the CIA's detention and interrogation program. And I'll call it short term, it's the Senate Torture Report because it's essentially a report on CIA's use of torture. Um, during the period from 2002 to 2008. Um, the executive summary um, is not your usual executive summary. It's 600 pages in length. It's highly detailed. It's full of footnotes. Um, it's an uh, executive summary of a 6,000 page report, which is still classified. Um, the government won't release that report. Um, but it investigates in detail um, the CIA's detention and interrogation program as it operated between 2002 and 2008. Um, one important piece missing from the report, however, is the rendition component of the CIA's program. Um, it's referenced in passing, um, but um, there is no detail, there's certainly not the detail that the report goes into in the CIA's use of torture of its use of rendition. Um, but the report itself, um, the, and the executive summary, it names the architects of the program, um, it names US officials who were involved in authorizing torture and covering it up, um, and misleading Congress in the process. Um, the report also provides details of the torture program's design and its implementation. Um, and very importantly for victims and survivors, it names in an annex in the back 119 men um, who were in CIA custody and who were subjected to uh, torture and cruel treatment while they were there. So with the publication of the executive summary, um, all the facts in that report are no longer state secrets. Um, they've been admitted um, by the CIA, the, the CIA and the United States itself, and they can no longer be regarded as state secrets. Um, and it's this fact that allowed us to proceed in the Salim versus Mitchell uh, litigation. Um, it had the effect of changing the legal landscape as, as it pertains to accountability in the United States. Um, and as I said, it allowed us to file the Salim uh, versus Mitchell litigation. Um, and Salim versus Mitchell is a case against two US psychologists, um, James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen. Um, they're identified in the report not by name, but by code name, and their names are Grayson Swigert and Hammond Dunbar. I don't know how the CAI came up with those <coughs> names, but that's who they were named in the report. But in the course of our litigation, the US government declassified those names, Grayson Swigert and Hammond Dunbar, and we know them officially as James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen. Um, and James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen were psychologists, and they're responsible for designing the torture methods used by the CIA in its program. Um, and these coercive methods 
were used to cause severe pain and suffering to psychologically break down prisoners. Um, and they had a theory that if you break somebody down into complete and utter helplessness, you're going to then divulge information to your interrogator. You're going to see to their demands for information. And unbelievably, uh, the CIA bought that theory. Um, the CIA was intent on using coercive measures from the very outset. Um, but what Mitchell and Jessen gave them was a pseudoscientific veneer to the use of torture. So they said, break these prisoners down by subjecting them to pain and suffering, and they'll give you, up, they'll give you information. Um, so they devised the um, techniques, and they devised the methodology for applying them. Um, but not only did Mitchell and Jessen's methods cause severe psychological damage, um, and I'll speak more about this later, but our, our clients all have got severe PTSD diagnosis, uh, major depression, and other psychological ailments. Um, but on top of that, they are also being severely physically damaged as a consequence um, of the, the, the torture methods. And what I'd like to do, if I can do this now, is uh, show um, one of our clients, Mohammed Ben Soud. Yeah. Um, while he was detained, his, his memory is incredible. This is a picture that Muhammad drew of his cell um, in the darkness. Um, that's what he calls Kobol. Kobol is the name of this prison that was in Afghanistan. And you'll see it's very rudimentary. Um, there was a bucket for a toilet, there was a blanket for a bed. Um, there was a chain on the wall where Muhammad was uh, chained in various different positions throughout his time um, in his year-long detention. And the entire facility, his cell, and the entire facility where he was detained was pitch black. He couldn't see five fingers in front of his face for the entire time that he was there. And it was a rancid smelling place. Um, so much so that Muhammad now has, still has sinus problems. He can't smell or taste as a consequence of um, the conditions that he was held under and interrogated uh, by the CIA. Um, and then uh, Muhammad has drawn a number of what he calls the instruments of torture. Um, if we go to the, the this this is a so again Muhammad drew this. It's a a row of boxes. Uh, narrow enough to fit a man inside, chain above your head, and on either side you see these two holes there, uh, music was blasted in at like ear splitting levels. Um, and Muhammad was chained in there numerous times for up to 45 minutes at a time, um, coming out feeling completely discombobulated, he didn't know where he was, all of this happening in the darkness. Um, and then uh, from there, he would go into uh, a small confinement box. This to me is one of the most, his description of this is just unbelievable. This is a box that is three feet by three foot square. That's like a meter, less than a meter square. Um, it had some holes in the side for breathing and it was locked. And Muhammad was forced inside there. Muhammad's a big man, he's over six foot tall crouched over um, and held in there for 45 minutes to an hour at a time. Um, that's one of Mitchell and Jessen's small boxes. They designed it, they designed the dimensions, and they designed the timing. Um, go to the next slide. Go to, um, let's see the waterboard. Uh, many of you here will have heard of what was called the waterboard. Again, this was a technique devised by Mitchell and Dressen. Um, Muhammad was strapped to the waterboard. He wasn't subjected to the waterboard method as we know it, but what they did do to him was strap him onto this by his arms and by his legs. Um, they put a bag over his head, and then they doused him with gallons of, gallons of cold water. Um, he was freezing, and then with a the bag over the head, it would suck around his mouth and, and nose, and he would feel like he was suffocating. He felt like he was dying. 
uh, that was the waterboard. And then the final technique, um, again, a Mitchell and Jason um, technique, and you'll hear them describe it in the video at the end, uh, this is the starting scene. This is a picture Mohammed drew, he actually drew, he hadn't drawn this at the time I'd met him, he drew this for me um, to show how he would be hung up by the arms. He was hung up by the arms, and we know this from the Senate report, for 36 hours at a stretch um, in a chain above, above him, just like this, standing on his tiptoes. Um, he couldn't sleep. If he fell asleep, his arms would feel like they'd become disjointed. Uh, when he was eventually let down, he had, his legs were engorged. Their edema had set in. Um, he didn't receive any treatment like for that. He was just taken back um, and left in his cell in darkness. Um, so those those are some of the the techniques that um, Mitchell and Jessen employed um, on on our clients. Um, it's it's really gruesome, and to actually hear Muhammad and Suleiman uh, tell how they were subjected to these horrors. I mean, for me, it's like, how did they manage to survive that? But it's also, how did these individuals, how did Mitchell and Jessen, how did the CIA operatives that were under their control and command, how could they do that to another human being? Um, it's, it just, it really beggars to me. Um, so Mitchell and Jessen, they helped the CIA to develop these techniques, um, and they used, they actually physically used the techniques on some detainees, um, and they, in doing so, what they did was experiment on them, um, because they'd never used these methods of an interrogation tool before, so they had to determine how much pain before you got to the stage of helplessness. So there was a continuing, ongoing assessment of detainees and their resilience to those techniques and whether or not they reached the stage of helplessness when Mitchell and Jessen believed you'd get good information from them. So they were experimenting. And you know, when I was putting the complaint together in this case, I said, this, this just smacks of Nuremberg. This is, this is scientific research on human beings. So that was actually one of the claims that we had in, um, in, in, in the complaint, which we'll discuss later. Um, and unbelievably, what the CIA allowed Mitchell and Jessen to do was not only design those techniques, develop them, tweak them, fine-tune them, they actually allowed them to evaluate their effectiveness. Were they doing their job of torturing um, detainees into helplessness? Um, they assessed their own handiwork. I mean, it's really, when you look back on this, this is, this is ridiculous. Um, but yet, that's what the CIA allowed them to do. They evaluated the effectiveness of their tortures. Um, and for the, this assistance and the evaluation process, Mitchell and Jessen were handsomely rewarded. Um, they were independent contractors to the CIA, and they earned a number of million dollars in that capacity. But then in 2005, unbelievably, the CIA awarded them a sole source contract to run the entire rendition, detention, and interrogation program. And for that, Mitchell and Jessen and Associates, the company they formed in 2005, were paid $81 million. $81 million. Um, so in Salim versus Mitchell, um, two survivors of the, um, the torture program, and the family of the third, Gul Rahman, um, they took on the doctors. Um, and we filed a lawsuit on their behalf um, in October of 2015. And Gul Rahman, because he died in CIA custody, um, he was represented by his nephew, Obaidullah. Um, and I met with all of them and I took their stories, and they're really incredible people. Um, I'd like to show you pictures of them because the United States, um, even though they weren't a party in this litigation, the United States has tried to have them remain faceless. Uh, and we, through the litigation, have managed to bring them into the public consciousness. I think here's their both here.
So this is Mohammed, Mohammed Ben Soud. Mohammed is uh, he's uh, from uh, Libya. He's a Libyan national. And uh, Mohammed was uh, he was actually he was a member of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, which was um, a group that was devoted to the overthrow of Gaddafi and uh, and the return of democracy to Libya. Uh, Mohammed, with uh, a number of his other LFIG members, was in Pakistan in 2001-2002, and uh, the CIA in cahoots with um, uh, then Gaddafi, who was in power. Gaddafi did not like the LFIG one little bit, and he saw um, the CIA's pursuit of terrorists, um, terrorists we should call Courtland, as a way of getting rid of the LFIG members. So. Uh, Mohammed was picked up as an LFIG member, um, the CIA believing that he had contacts with Al-Qaeda. Do any research into LFIG and you'll find that they had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda, but Mohammed was picked up uh, and he was detained in Cobalt, you saw his drawings, um, for one year before he was released. And where did the, the CIA release him? They released him into the hands of um, his mortal enemy, uh, the Gaddafi regime uh, then in power in, in Libya. Um, here the next slide is, uh, this is uh, Suleiman. Uh, Suleiman is from Tanzania. Uh, Suleiman, uh, he's a fisherman. He's a, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, he was picked up in Somalia in 2003 and he was rendered from Somalia to Kenya um, to Basasso to Djibouti and then to the dark prison, the same dark prison as uh, Mohammed was kept in and Suleiman was kept there for six weeks and again the same techniques that were applied to Mohammed, the same torture that he was subjected to, Suleiman was subjected to also. And then finally we have uh, Gul Rahman. Um, Gul Rahman in November of 2002 um, died in CIA custody. Um, he died of hypothermia. He died um, half naked, chained in one of Mitchell and Jessen's techniques to the ceiling. Um, and the most terrific thing about the circumstances of Bill Rachman's death is that the CIA never notified the family of his death and to this day have not returned the remains or identified the remains. Um, where their uncle, their father, uh, their brother um, is. Uh, we're making attempts to do that now. We did through the entire course of the litigation. But for me personally and for the ACLU, it remains, um, it, it remains a, a very difficult part of the litigation and an outstanding issue that, 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 that we still need to, to address in some way. So those, those are the, these are the three heroes of this litigation. Um, it was a very, very hard fought battle. Um, caused Suleiman and Mohammed and Abidullah to relive their trauma, sometimes on a daily basis. Um, me asking them continual questions about um, what was happening to them, um, you know, to get their stories initially, but then in the course of litigation, the defendants are asking them questions. And we have to get information from them, and each time, we talk about the torture, that it's re-traumatizing for the torture survivor. It causes them to relive that those dark days that they want to put behind them. Um, so the litigation is really hard on, on survivors. Um, the US uh, legal system is not hospitable to torture survivors, but it's a testament to these guys that they drove on. Um, they wanted justice and they felt and put their trust in us to get that for them. Um, they, two of them, Mohammed and Suleiman, had to subject to invasive psychological and medical testing by defendants' lawyers. That, you know, I was with them throughout that process. It's, it was just, I was disgusted by it. Um, but that's what we had to do to get through this process, and that's what Mohammed and, and Suleiman knew they had to do and that's what they, they did, um, all in the cause of getting some form of justice. Um, horribly, they had to go through what are called depositions. Uh, depositions, and you'll see this in the video which I'm gonna play very shortly. Uh, depositions are a uniquely US um, litigation tool. It's an opportunity 
for the other side to quest before trial to question the other side. Um, so for Suleiman and Muhammad, this was just an interrogation. They were asked about how painful the techniques were. They were asked, uh, you know, what they were doing in Afghanistan. It was two days they had to go through that with translators um, about what um, happened to them, how they were tortured. Um, it was really brutal to watch, and for them to go through, it was it it, it, it really was re-traumatizing. Um, but on the upside, what we, as their lawyers, got to do was to put Mitchell and Jessen on the spot. We got to ask them questions. We got to interrogate them uh, about their role in torture um, and uh, their complete lack of experience in interrogation. And what we also got to do, and you'll see this in the video too, is we, uh, for the first time ever as civilian lawyers in the United States, got to put Jose Rodriguez, who was then head of the CIA's counterterrorism center, on the spot. We got to ask him questions. And this, you'll see the questions. This guy, he's not smart. Um, <laughs> uh, he squirmed. Um, it, was, it was really satisfying. And our clients, you know, Mohammed and Suleiman and Obaidala, they actually got to see that. They loved that part. Um, and we also got to put the then head, the head lawyer in the CIA at the time, uh, John Rizzo, we got to put him on the spot too, and he squirmed too about questions. We got to ask, ask him, you know, whether he thought torture was a good thing, you know? Um, it, was, it, was, it was fulfilling for us, it was also fulfilling for our clients, it got them at some measure of redress, um, but their interrogators were finally being interrogated and put on the spot. Um, but as I say, I, I said this yesterday, and I, I really do believe this um, in, in the circumstances and what I've been talking about, it's, it's really hard stuff. What I'd like to do is play you um, a video, it's a short video, um, that the New York Times put together about the depositions and about the deposition process. Uh, and you'll get to see Jose Rodriguez on the spot, you'll get to see John Rizzo, but you'll also get to see Suleiman, uh, and uh, Mohammed and James Mitchell and Bruce Jessen. Um, and this is the, the deposition process. And I think the New York Times too does a very good job of giving the overview and what the, what the issues are in this case. So sound permitting and video permitting, we should get to see that. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just wrap up at the end and uh, give you a summary. Okay. Uh, that's it. We were soldiers doing what we were instructed to do. This is Bruce Jessen, a former military psychologist who became a CIA contractor, and his colleague, James Mitchell. Uh, any expertise in the art of interview? My God, I'm a clinical psychologist. Interviews are what we do. They've been described as the architects of the extremely harsh interrogation program used at secret CIA prisons after 9-11. Jim and I went into a cubicle, sat down at a, at a he sat down at the typewriter, and together uh, we wrote out and typed up the, the list that I've seen in the documents here uh, that was submitted. They're now defendants in a case brought by some of the men tortured in those prisons: Suleiman Salim, Mohammed Ben Soud, and Obaidullah, the nephew of Gul Rahman, who died in custody. This is the first time that Mitchell and Jessen are facing lawyers for former detainees. We exclusively obtained video depositions from the case, which is scheduled for trial in September. Watch throughout as Mitchell and Jessen attempt to defend themselves, both rhetorically and emotionally. If I want to get information from you, Dor, I don't want to slap you. And I don't want to wall you. I don't want to waterboard you. Uh, even if you're my enemy. Jessen, who's never spoken publicly about his role, at times appears to wrestle with what happened, whereas Mitchell, who wrote a book about his experiences, comes off as more polished and assertive. I disagree with this, the suggestion that w we were architects because we weren't breaking new ground, you know, in the sense that uh, 
that architects do. Mitchell and Jessen didn't directly interrogate the two surviving men who brought this case, but the methods they proposed were used on them and at least 37 other men. A fascinating aspect of these videos is how their accounts of enhanced interrogation dramatically differ from what the detainees describe. I'm a pretty good judge of what it's like to be Wall. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, I remember also them putting a cloth around, tying a cloth around my neck, and then they are punching me on the wall. Oh, it's discombobulating. It's not painful. Um, uh, my guess would be that some of the folks sitting here have been walled. It, it stirs up your inner ears, and uh, it's like being on one of those whirly gigs or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you move around quite a bit, and, it, and uh, in the, you know, uh, it's, it's, in fact, you, if it's painful, you're doing it wrong. There is a tether anchored to the ceiling in the center of the detention cell. The detainee has handcuffs, and they're attached to the tether in a way that they can't lie down or rest against the wall. Uh, they're monitored to make sure they don't get edema if they hang on the cuffs too much. Um, Holding so-called stress positions for hours was another technique used on detainees. I remember being tied on the wall, handicapped on the wall, and I, I couldn't go up or come down. This is Jose Rodriguez, former head of the CIA's counterterrorism center. On 60 Minutes, where you um, analogized the stress positions to um, working out in a gym. Correct. Yeah. Um, do you, do you think that's a good analogy to what the, the kind of discomfort that the stress positions cause? I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. So you don't know? I answer. don't know. Okay. I can't describe how painful it is. Do you presently experience the pain? Yes. Can you describe for me the pain that you feel presently? Maybe I need to tie you here so that for one hour so you can feel the pain if you want to know the pain. We we'll take a break. We can take a break. In this next section, we hear Mitchell talk in almost casual terms about simulated drowning, which the U.S. had long considered torture. The plaintiffs in this case were not subjected to this technique, but other detainees were. I mean, you thought waterboarding was a bad thing, was a, a, a painful thing, right? No, I thought, it, I thought it could be done safely. I thought he would be uncomfortable. It sucks, mm -hmm. you know. It's, uh, I don't know that it's painful, uh, well, I saw an interview. it's distressing. Mm -hmm. I saw an interview with you where you said it was, <coughs> as between uh, somebody breaking their leg and somebody being waterboarded, most people would choose to have their leg broken. Do you remember saying that in an interview? No. Okay. Now you're using the word painful. I'm using the word distressing. Okay. Two things are not synonymous in my okay. mind. Uh, the, the pressure is designed to be used in a way that it doesn't harm, but it makes someone uncomfortable. And they're more irritating than painful. This entire case, really, gets to the question of personal responsibility within a larger system. If you feel the government is pressing you to cross boundaries, to what extent should you resist? We also didn't want to use waterboarding. We ended up uh, in a video conference with Jose Rodriguez and a bunch of folks. And uh, prior to that, Bruce and I had said, we're not going to continue doing this. And what they said was, well, we'll you guys have lost your spine. They kept telling me every day a nuclear bomb was going to be exploded in the United States, and that because I told them to stop, I'd lost my nerve, and it was going to be my fault if I didn't continue. I think the word that was actually used is, is that you guys are pussies. There's going to be another attack in America, and the blood of dead civilians are going to be on your hands. If you won't follow through with this, then we're going to send somebody out there who will because we worked for them and they wanted it continued. Justice Department lawyers approved the techniques. 
Based in part on what Mitchell and Jessen told them, they concluded that the techniques would cause no lasting harm. And by their reasoning, that meant they wouldn't amount to torture. Do you think that the enhanced interrogation techniques could result in long-term harm? No. Why is that? It never did. I don't know that for a fact. It, mm -hmm. It's one of those things that you can establish. If, if they're out there and that happened, then, you know, show me the data. I think none of the men that I was involved in with while I was involved with them, experienced anything that would have led to that. I'm very convinced of that. Have you suffered any psychological injuries uh, as a result of your captivity in Cobalt? Papa? Of course. What are they? My home. I call it Nightmares. Can you tell me about these nightmares? I go a bit at a teeny fee. It comes uh, to me during my sleep, and as if I'm still imprisoned in that horrible uh, place uh, and uh, still shackled. In addition to recurring nightmares, Mr. Bensoud describes feelings of anxiety, fear, and worry. Salim also describes ongoing effects. When asked about his feelings of isolation, he responds. I don't feel like being with people. I like being by myself, but I don't like walking around to see people. I feel like I'm so weak and I can't do anything. Mitchell and Jessen continued working with the CIA for many years. They set up a contracting company, and ultimately they ran many aspects of the CIA's interrogation program. For that work, their company received $81 million. In the end, whether or not Mitchell and Jessen or the former detainees prevail in this case, it's already had a profound effect. At a time when the world still confronts the threat of terrorism, we now know much more about a recent episode in U.S. history. I'll just very briefly conclude, in large part due to the depositions, and in particular the incredible depositions that our clients took sat through and took and gave, um, and a number of excellent pre-trial decisions from the, um, the, 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 the court where this case was being litigated. Um, by an excellent judge, uh, judge, um, and I'll name him, uh, he was so great uh, throughout this whole process. Uh, very empathetic towards uh, the detainees and their positions. Uh, judge Justin Quackenbush, an 87-year-old Carter appointee, no-nonsense judge. Um, he saw this case for what it was. Uh, it was a case of torture, and it was a case of persons who had been harmed by torture, and somebody had to be held to account. And uh, his decision, his final decision um, on what's called a summary judgment motion was just um, the best we could have asked for. And what it did was it caused the defendant's lawyers to approach us um, and our clients and say, we'd like to settle this case out of court. And that's the way most cases uh, go in uh, US courts. They settle, they don't go to full trial. Uh, going to full trial, there would have been numerous risks um, for the defendants, but also for our clients too. And then we went to full trial, there would have been appeal processes. Our clients would have had to sit through giving testimony. It, it was a very arduous process. A settlement was really um, the best for our clients. Um, and that's what we did after very long and hard negotiations. Um, the clients decided that they wanted to settle this case. Uh, and we did in August this year. Um, that settlement is really landmark. Um, it's the first case in 15 year, um, 15 year long effort by advocates uh, to hold US torturers to account uh, to provide some meaningful redress for some of the survivors. Um, but that settlement really could never have happened um, uh, but for the incredible groundwork of journalists, um, 15 years of reporting on this issue, 
human rights advocates and advocacy outside the courtroom, um, but most of all the courage and real tenacity of um, the survivors, and in particular Suleiman, Muhammad, and um, Ubaidullah. And they really stood up and they spoke, spoke truth to power um, in, in, a, in a US court, and they prevailed. Um, and just like a concluding word on, it, on, it, on accountability, um, I think that the Saleem litigation and the Senate torture uh, report in particular really has cracked the door, the accountability door open in the United States. Um, but we still have a very long way to go. Um, we still need to address accountability uh, more holistically and more comprehensively um, through criminal prosecutions. Um, and a more survivor-centered mechanism uh, to obtain redress for the other victims and survivors, and one that doesn't necessitate the re-traumatization of victims and survivors, as, as, as you saw very clearly on, on this video. Um, they've endured enough. They've endured uh, pain and suffering at the hands of their torturers. They shouldn't now be subjected to that through um, the US legal system. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, I think we have some time for questions. I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Yeah, good time. Um, I always just wanted to uh, wanted to ask uh, how are the men doing today? Uh, Suleiman and, uh, and uh, Mohammed. As I say, Suleiman and Mohammed are, are and Obaidullah are they're very good friends of mine. They're never off uh, WhatsApp. Um, we've settled the case, but. As I've said to them, uh, you know, they're, you know, I have an attorney-client relationship with them, but if you're working with torture survivors, they become more than just your client, they become your friends. You have to work on building a trust that has been broken horribly for them um, with individuals and also with institutions. Um, Suleiman, I can't disclose the terms of the settlement agreement, it was confidential, but let me tell you all here, it was life-changing for um, all three. Um, Suleiman uh, was, he's just been WhatsApping me from um, Durban in South Africa just now, he's, he's on his way to buy uh, two engines for his boat, he's a fisherman. Um, He's also a, a pigeon fancier. He trades in fancy pigeons. I learned all about pigeons. <laughs> um, I learned how to treat them uh, or, uh, with homeopathic medicines. <laughs> uh, so Suleiman is, Suleiman is doing great, but he is, that's not to take away from the fact that he is very fragile. Out of the three, he's probably the most fragile of, 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 of them all in terms of his PTSD. It's, uh, you know, the litigation, you know, at all times, his PTSD symptoms were through the roof. Um, it was very difficult to deal with him, but he had incredible trust in me and his other lawyers, and, uh, you know, we got him through that process. Uh, Mohammed, uh, you know, and, and Suleiman, you know, he's married, he has, he's just recently had a second kid. Um, he has some stability in his home community, but, he feels very, still very isolated in, in his, he, he lives in Zanzibar, but very isolated. He feels very stigmatized still um, by the fact that he was detained for as long as he was. He was in CIA black site and then in Bagram for no reason uh, for five years. Um, uh, Mohammed, on the other hand, has a really strong family around him. Um, a wife who thought he disappeared forever when he was picked up in Pakistan and five kids. Um, I have a very strong bond with him too, so much so that they've actually named a corner in Mohammed's living room after me, it's called Stephen's Corner, because his kids, uh, every time Mohammed would, I would be needing to ask him questions in terms of the litigation and he would disappear into a corner and uh, Marwan, uh, one of his kids would say, is it Stephen on the phone again? Yeah, it's me again asking him lots of questions. Mohammed is, is very resilient, you know, I think a lot of his time in the LFIG, his, um, his time, you know, he was fighting, he was in combat before, um, so he was able to manage the, the trauma in a way that Suleiman just, you know, he's, he, Suleiman's just, he really was a fisherman, you know, he was like a, you know, he was actually a pop head fisherman, he was just a regular small guy, um, so his, the trauma was much more uh, symptom, it caused much more PTSD symptoms for him. 
And of course, um, you know, Ubaidullah, the nephew of Bul Rahman, the entire family, uh, the trauma that has pervaded them and still does because of the disappearance of the body, that it really haunts me, this case. Um, but they were, with, through the litigation, able to have some closure um, over their uncle's disappearance, but continued disappearance. Um, they held uh, a couple of memorial services, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan, to celebrate uh, their uncle's life. Um, and, um, you know, God willing, um, we're going to see if we can actually eventually track down the remains of the body for him. So all three are doing as well as can be expected. I think the litigation process was really hard on them, but I also think the litigation process was really good for them. I mean, Suleiman says, you know, he's come out of this stronger. Um, you saw him in that deposition. He was, he was great. Uh, it was it took place in South Africa um, because the United States wouldn't allow men in Sevilla to fly into South Africa, and the defendants came down here. Um, and we had two days of deposition, and you saw him. He went into flashback uh, there. He went in flashback a couple of times. We brought him out said, look, you don't have to go back into that deposition room. No, he wants to go. And uh, out the other side, it was, it was really beautiful. He, he really felt stronger. Um, so the litigation process, you know, and I lambast it for being really cruel to torture survivors. It's also, um, it was incredibly rejuvenating in a way um, and reaffirming um, for Suleiman. And, Muhammad too, uh, very, very trying, but they actually felt stronger when they came out the other side. Um, and that's, you know, that's, it encapsulates two of the real needs that torture survivors uh, have, and that is acknowledgement and apology. And without that, and um, that building, rebuilding of trust, uh, they really cannot move forward and uh, heal, their, heal their broken lives. Um, money is really not why any of um, the three individuals got involved in this lawsuit um, and all the other men that I have interviewed and represented in litigation in the United States that's been the farthest from the mind. Um, it's all about acknowledgement and apology. Uh, I've really seen that and that acknowledgement and apology does wonders in terms of their healing process. Is there any question from the audience? Um, if not, I will ask the final question. And what what will will this mean for the rest of the survivors and, and torture victims? This is, was a um, an agreement, um, and it was not a, a, a decision by the court, and it was not a criminal case. Uh, you mentioned yesterday that there were, I think, one hundred and nineteen. Uh, survivors or 19, um, 19 mentioned in the Senate report uh, that actually also have a right to some kind of justice. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what will this mean um, for them? So, so this case was against two key architects in the torture program, Mitchell and Jessen. Technically speaking, the theory of our case that they aided and abetted uh, in torture um, and war crimes um, any number of the 119 uh, named in the Senate report would have recourse against Mitchell and Jessup. However, uh, there are numerous other obstacles to the ones that we encountered um, that they would have to get, get through legal and otherwise, logistical even, um, in order to prevail in a court. And that's why my call at the end is for the United States to have some other mechanism to provide compensation and rehabilitation, uh, measures of rehabilitation for all men who have been subjected to um, US um, torture. Um, it's, it's key because litigation is kind of an ad hoc tool. Um, we really need a much more holistic approach to uh, redress for survivors. Do you see any chance of there being any criminal um, prosecutions? You know, criminal prosecutions take political will. Um, in 2009, there was, uh, for under the Obama administration, there was um, a an investigation initiated into certain uh, detainee deaths in CIA custody, one of them being Bill Rachman. Um, the 
uh, remit of the investigation was not transparent. We didn't know what what that remit was um, and what the, the ground rules were. Uh, so, for example, we, did, we have heard anecdotally that um, they used the definition of torture. You know, if somebody can find, be prosecuted for torture, it has to fit the definition that was in place in August the 1st, 2002, and that was a def very narrow definition of torture. It said only conduct that constitutes um, organ failure or near death, um, the pain associated with organ failure or near death is the level that it must be attained before we are going to prosecute. So one only can imagine that the investigation was very narrow and they couldn't find conduct that met that. So that that limited criminal investigation was closed, you know, within a year of it opening. And Obama took the position, a uh, very public position. He said um, that we're not going to look backwards. We're going to look forwards. And what he was saying, in other words, is under my watch, there's going to be no accountability, whether criminal or civil. Um, so, you know. We lambast the Bush administration for um, its use of torture, but Obama and his administration um, are equally to blame for the situation we are in now because he did not promote accountability at all. He looked, he looked forward and did not look back. And as we all know, that if we don't do that, then history repeats itself. And under this current administration, the Trump administration, I mean, he's already said, will bring back waterboarding and a whole lot worse. And that's because there was no full stop put on these practices during the Obama administration. Uh, there must be that. Thank you so much, Stephen. Unfortunately, we were running out of time, so but thank you so much for being here and telling us this extremely important um, story. It's not a story, it's a case. So thank you very much. Thank you.